So we are going to start today with Plato. And as I said, I was hoping that you would done the reading. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, with the rise of the, the sophists, philosophy makes a change in its direction from the natural philosophers and metaphysics to epistemology, study of knowledge. With Socrates, we, we have a further transition. With Socrates, we now transfer, tr have a transference to uh, moral philosophy as well as epistemology. Plato is the first of the really systematic Western philosophers. He covers everything. Today we're going to start with his epistemology, his theory of knowledge. And it begins, we're going to begin with what's called the divided line of knowledge. I'm sorry, I take that back. We're going to start with the cave. Plato describes knowledge and uses the cave as an analogy. Assume you've been in a cave your whole life, <coughs> shackled <coughs> in such a way you can only face forward. You can't turn around, you can't look left, you can't look right, you can only look forward. And all your life, the only thing you've seen are the shadows on the wall. So what constitutes reality for you? The shadows on the wall, of course. Now let's assume you and you alone break your shackles. And now you can turn around. And what do you see? You see the parapet. And you see objects moving along the parapet. So what do you now know that the rest of your fellow prisoners don't know? The truth. The truth! Absolutely! The shadows aren't real. It's the cutouts moving along the parapet that are real. So what do you do at that moment? Trying to find what's passing the shadow? You try to convince others. Bingo! You know the truth now. And when you know the truth, what do you have to do? Sure. Tell everybody. It, it's almost an imperative with us as human beings. When I discover the truth, I have to tell everybody. <laughs> but you all look at me and think I'm Crazy. wacko, which you do anyway. Uh, I think I'm wacko. Now, I move along, and now I see the fire. fire. Now I understand the shadows on the wall. It's not the shadow that's real. It's not the pair of the uh, cutouts that are real. It's the fire. The fire is real. So what do I do? Tell everyone. I come back down and I said, "You guys were right. I was wrong. It's not the silhouettes. It's the fire." fire. Now you think I'm really what? Crazy. Crazier than a loon. And then I take the long, rugged descent out of the cave and into the what? Outside world. And what do I see? Everything. The sun. What does it do? Catch that. No, what does the sun do if you haven't seen it in your whole life? It blinds you. It blinds you. Oh my God. This is absolutely reality now. And I'm confused and I'm dazed and I'm overwhelmed and I'm awed. After I adjust, what do I do? Go back and tell everyone. I got to go back and tell everybody. But now when I go back in the cave, it's, I'm a little disoriented again, right? So now I get in front of everyone and say, you guys were right. It's not the silhouettes. It's not the fire. Ultimate reality is the, the sun. And of course, all you guys want to do is kill me. Okay? Because I've blown your whole world. So this is the progression. <clears throat> you have two worlds. The worlds of illusion is on this side. And when I get to the silhouettes, I have moved from total illusion to what Plato calls a state of belief. And we'll go to this in great detail. 
once I understand it's the fire that's causing it, I've reached the third level of reason. Okay? And then when I reach the fourth level, I'm in the world of wisdom. This is how knowledge is. We go from illusion to wisdom, passing through belief and reason. What you're doing is you're having four different ways to look at the same thing. There's four ways to look at the shadow. Through illusion, through belief, through reason, and through wisdom. <clears throat> the divided line, I'm mean, sorry, the allegory of the cave. Some thoughts on Plato's allegory of the cave. What is it telling us? Can anyone give me, yes sir. Uh, that wisdom can only be found through trial and error. Um, testing ones. That, that, that's okay. I like that. I like that. It's not quite what Plato has in mind, but it makes perfect sense. What else does it tell you about knowledge or wisdom? If it's through trial and error... It takes time. It takes time. A great deal of time. What else? You have to see it for yourself. You have to discover it for yourself. I can't pass it on to you. How do I know this? Because when I told them the silhouettes were real, did you believe me? No, when I told you the fire was real, did I, when I told you that you don't believe me, you have to discover knowledge for yourself. Very good. So knowledge cannot be transferred, but the student must be guided to make their own decision about what reality is and what's important. I can guide you, but I can't transfer my knowledge to you. I can guide you through the same road that I took to get there. Also that in the allegory you're seeing light, and seeing light is the gaining of knowledge. Uh, it can be painful at first. When you discover something, that you are convinced of, that contradicts what you previously thought, it's very difficult to give up your previous beliefs. And you struggle with it. We all do that. We struggle with it. Sometimes the old beliefs went out for a while until they can no longer stand the scrutiny of what you've learned. You can no longer suppress the reality of the new truth. Also, once a person is enlightened, <coughs> they have a responsibility to society. What's that responsibility? Share the knowledge. To try to share the knowledge, but I can't transfer it, right? Mm -hmm. So that becomes very difficult. I cannot transfer to you my own personal experiences. I can talk about it, but I can't transfer it. I can, again, show you the road map, but I can't take the ride for you. Also, and this is a stretch from the little bit I've given you about the cave, rulers must be wise, not eager to rule. And they have to be willing to live among the populace. In other words, they have to have an understanding of what's going on with the people they rule. And they cannot be rulers because they want to rule, only because they have supposedly reached a certain point of knowledge that makes them better equipped to be rulers. Yes? Isn't it also possible to interpret that last part as they have to show humility? Well, sure. You can interpret it any way you want. Uh, Humility is a good thing, as long as it isn't false humility. Unfortunately, in order to be humble and have humility, you have to know you have something to be humble about. You can't show humility and be humble unless you know you have something to be humble about. Think about that for a while. Education. <coughs> Mm 
We have the ability to learn. But moving from becoming to being is to be accomplished slowly. Becoming is part of the illusionary world, the world of belief as well. But being is the road to wisdom. And we'll see why when we get to the divided line of knowledge in a few minutes. And you accomplish this not by learning facts. Facts are basically useless bits of trivia. The fact that I know that the Eiffel Tower is taller than the Statue of Liberty is meaningless. The fact that I know that Liberty Island, where the Statue of Liberty is, used to be called Bellows Island, is useless. What do you really have to acquire? You have to become a good person. You have to become good. And again, as we get into play, you'll see what this means in greater detail. The virtue of wisdom may be made good and useful or evil and useless through habit and exercise. So if I have wisdom and I use it for bad aims, it's not good. It's evil. If I have wisdom, I can also use it to be useful and beneficial and good. So wisdom itself, by itself, is neutral. It's what I do with it that makes it good or evil. Plato says that good leaders in a republic are educated and that the end of a formal education does not indicate an end to learning. Good leaders understand and know how to work and do work as their cons constituents do. They have a connection to the constituents. They are not over and above the constituents. They are actually part of the constituents, but they're in the role of a leader. <coughs> Good leaders are always willing to learn. They're not ideologues. They're not fixed in their positions. Good leaders have a better life outside of politics. Sometimes in our society, their life gets better when they are part of the political scheme. <clears throat> but for Plato, a good leader should be giving something up when they become a leader. It shouldn't be a way to increase your wealth. What they are rich in is virtue and wisdom. And good leaders are not to be lovers of the task of leading. They do it out of a sense of responsibility, not in a sense of desire to be a ruler. They have a responsibility, because when you acquire knowledge or wisdom, what do you have to do with it? You've got to apply it, you've got to share it with everybody else. <clears throat> Later on, in the book called The Dialogue Called The Republic, he gives a very detailed analysis of what's represented in the cave. It's called the divided line of knowledge.
Well, now I'll give you the explanation. This is the vital line of knowledge. It's spelled out in the Republic. And what it is, is Plato divides the world of knowledge into two aspects. The lower half and the upper half. The lower half, the lower two parts, that belongs to the sensory world. And it's understood to be the world of opinion. The lowest level, Icasia, that's the Greek word for imagining. When you're in the state of Icasia or imagining, you take images and shadows to be the ultimate reality of the world, just like the people in the cave. So you're the best prisoner at this level. Now, I know none of you believe you're at this level, you're at a much higher level. But who is at that level? Come on. Infants? Yeah, children. I remember when, when my son was very little, one night he woke up crying, and he said, there's monsters in the closet. <clears throat> Can you convince a kid there's no monsters in the closet? Yes. Absolutely not. You open the closet and say, look, dummy, there's no monsters in there. Oh, they're invisible when you open up the door. <laughs> right? They'll, they'll give a justification for everything. So they really believed that the images and the shadows and their imaginings are ultimate reality. Now, in my case, it was easy to convince them they didn't have to worry about the monsters, not that there weren't monsters. I had a 110-pound Rottweiler at the time named Noose which, as you know, means mind in Greek. It's not N-O-O-S-E, it's N-O-U-S. And I'd say, look, the monsters are afraid of noose, and I'd send noose into the closet. I said, they'll smell them now, they won't ever come back. The dog wasn't allowed on that side of the house under normal circumstances. Now, I knew I had to do it this way, in instinctively, because five years later, his sister says, Daddy, there's snakes in the closet. What am I going to tell them? There's no such thing as snakes. <laughs> you see the thing? It's, that's what imagining is. You, you take something to be reality, and you can't shake people of it. And so what I did is I grabbed my cat, Xantippe, which is Socrates' wife's name, uh, because my cat had a very loud voice and screamed all the time. And I grabbed him by the scruff of the neck, and I threw him in the closet, and I said, you know that snakes are afraid of cats. So they'll smell the cat and they won't come back and boom, I put him outside and my daughter went to sleep. That's what it means to be in the state of my case. Now, eventually you grow out of the state of Icasia and you reach a level known as pistis. Pistis is belief. What does that mean? It means knowing how to do something. All of you, well not all of you, I assume most of you know how to ride a bicycle. Or you know how to swim. And this is your knowledge about physical things in the world. Uh, the fact that you know how doesn't mean you can explain what's happening. I mean, riding a bicycle involves many, many things. <coughs> it, 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 it requires a sense of knowing where your body is. It involves an understanding of kinesiology, how your muscles and bones and skeletal system move. It has to do with balance in your inner ear. It has to do with centrifugal forces, it has to do with many things. You don't understand any of that. Just like you don't understand what's going on in your car when you drive it. You turn on the ignition, you know how to drive the car, but you don't know what's happening. Same thing with the computer, you know how to use it. And that's this level of knowledge. And both of these levels are the sensory world and they're in the world of opinion. Because what you believe to be true can turn out to be what? Oh. False. When you move from pistis to dianoia, which is also understood to be thinking or knowing what's happening, you've crossed over from the world of opinion to the world of knowledge. And here, in this state of mind, these are the things that you're thinking about, mathematical entities. You're not thinking about a triangle, you're thinking about triangularity. You're not thinking about a circle, you're thinking and understanding about circularity. See the difference? Because if you're dealing with a triangle, you are here. If you're dealing about triangularity, 
you're there. Got it? That makes sense to you? This is the third level of knowledge. Uh, we start from the bottom, first, second, third. Eventually, if you ever do reach the fourth state of mind in the divided line of knowledge, it's called noesis, and you have true knowledge. That's knowing why for what purpose things are happening and how everything is tied together. And for Plato, at this point, you have knowledge of the forms, and we'll go in great detail on what the forms are. The forms are the ultimate reality of the world. Yes, sir? So, do these steps plan each other, or is it like once you go on to the next one, the one below that is kind of lost? No, 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 no. None of it's lost. There are four different ways of looking at the same thing. There are four different aspects of the same thing. When you reach the fourth level, you now have knowledge, true knowledge, of the ultimate reality of the world that Plato calls the forms, and they are ideas. Now, they are ideas that really exist. They're not just mental concepts. Just like for Parma uh, Pythagoras, numbers are real. For us, they're abstractions. Ideas for Plato are real. They are the ultimate reality of the world. And we will see why in a few minutes. So the forms consist of things like beauty, truth, justice, goodness. There is an ideal form for everything that exists in the world. There are individual humans, but there is something known as humanists being human, the quality of being human, or dogginess, the quality of being a dog. And we will see why Plato insists on this. So this follows the allegory of the cave. Being tied up, seeing the silhouettes, seeing the fire, seeing the sun. And the highest form of all is called the good. Sometimes it's included here, but sometimes it's above everything. Divided line of knowledge. Everyone see the relationship between the divided line of knowledge and the allegory of the cave? Okay. The highest form, which I just said is what? The, the good. good. The good, I hope. It's the form of the good, <coughs> which many people interpret as what Plato means by the word God. I used to make a joke that God's less than good because it only has one. I won't make that joke. So the form of the good is the ultimate object of knowledge. And it sheds light on all the other forms. So all the forms are derived from the form of the good. And the ultimate object of knowledge is to understand the form of the good so you can understand all the other forms. As we see from the allegory of the cave, the sun represents the form of the good in the allegory of the cave. So Plato compares the form of the good to the sun which sheds its light on things in the perceptual world and makes them visible. So, the form of the good is what gives you access to everything else in the world of the forms. And I do mean the world of the forms. The forms exist in their own world, the world of the forms. And the reason he introduces this notion of form is because he wants to solve the problem of knowledge. The sophists say all knowledge is relative. Well, if all knowledge is relative, is there anything known as absolute truth? No. No. There's no truth, there's no justice, no beauty. It's only what a group of people at a given time think is true or beautiful or just. He can't abide that. Because that would mean Certain activities in village A are okay, but in village B they're not okay, and that doesn't make any sense. It's inconsistent. He wants to solve this problem. He does it by introducing the forms, and he gives them certain characteristics. First of all, they're real, they're ideas, and they're stable. 
Remember for Heraclitus, you can't know everything, everything's changing, you need something stable in order to have knowledge. Well, the forms are stable. That means they never change. They're immutable. That's what immutable means, can never change. They're eternal. They always have been, they are, and they always will be. They're not created. And this is what the problem consists of. By the way, what time is it? It's 9.28 a.m. Not anymore, is it? Is. <laughs> What's the only correct answer to the question, what time is it? Change it. Now. Now. Because when I ask the question, it's 9.10 and whatever seconds. When you answer it, it's no longer that time anymore. So the answer you give is not the answer to the question I asked when I asked it. Because time is ever changing. It's not stable. So the answer to the question, what time is, it will always be wrong as soon as it's given. Any temporal or material thing is constantly changing. And because of that, what can't it be? Absolute. Absolute. It cannot be the object of knowledge. Because it's always changing. If something's always changing, can you ever know it? No. And you can't know it because it's not stable. And knowledge requires a stable object of knowledge. So it can't be anything material. What do we know about everything in the material world? It changes. It's changing, it's moving, it deteriorates, it has a beginning, it has an end. And therefore, it's not stable. Not being stable means it cannot be the object of knowledge. The object of knowledge has to have certain characteristics that things in the material world can never have. Hello. I heard a whistle. So the forms, which are ideas, are the stable objects of knowledge. And it's thought, the mind, that gives access to the forms, not our sensory apparatus. Sensory apparatus is only good for coming in contact with material, world. material things. Thank you. It is our mind through thought that gives access to the forms, not the senses. And the mind must be trained, and it must be trained in mathematics logical reason thought and developed in philosophy so you get the tools in mathematics and you learn to develop those tools in philosophy great way to justify your own existence isn't it i mean plato's a philosopher right <laughs> the forms what about the forms they are universal. They exist everywhere at the same time. Always existed, do exist, and will always exist. They are not particular, and we'll get into particulars and universals in just a moment. They're the common object of knowledge. They are intersubjective. That means everyone has access to them in theory. They are absolute, not relative to what you think they are. They are what they are. They're absolute. They're objective, not subjective. They're not dependent upon you. And they're identified by definition. The form is continued. They're eternal. They are the unchanging source of knowledge. They're not created, and they never pass out of existence. They're eternal. No beginning, no end. They are real, which means they're being. They're never becoming, because becoming requires what? Change. Change, and they're immutable. Forms have independent existence. That means if everything in the world disappeared, the forms would still exist. They're not dependent on anything.
They are like the uniform universal laws of nature. They're invisible and immaterial. Why? Because the material is ever changing, as we said previously. Now, Plato's not denying the existence of material things. They're just saying they're not the ultimate reality of the world. Which then means that ideas in some way have to be responsible for the material reality of the world. I don't know if you remember, but early on I said, with respect to met metaphysics, there's only four possible answers. The world's immaterial or the world's material, or the words the world is immaterial with material aspects, or it's material with immaterial <coughs> aspects. Plato's saying the world is in its ultimate reality immaterial. But that immaterial reality is responsible for that part of the world that we understand as the material world. And so material particulars, individual things, have to be related to forms. And there's different ways that they're related according to Plato. There is obviously a distinction between the intelligible world and the perceptual world. Uh, this idea, by the way, has ramifications, and we will see them when we get to the Middle Ages for Plotinus and uh, Augustine. The Judeo-Christian Islamic doctrine happens to agree with Plato's metaphysics. Spirit is absolutely distinct and infinitely superior to the received physical world. The immaterial world. Spirit is absolutely distinct and infinitely superior to the received physical world. Spirit here doesn't mean the Holy Ghost. Okay, or the Holy Spirit. It means that which is immaterial. For Plato. The question becomes, how do you know the forms? How do you get to know the forms? Well, it requires reflection, wanting to know the forms, and thinking about them. The Socratic dialectic, which is the question and answers. Plato, uh, Socrates would ask a question, someone would give an answer. Socrates would go on to destroy that answer by asking questions that lead to contradictions so that idea cannot be correct and therefore you have to start the process all over again. And Eros. Eros is love. And we'll see that in a moment. So how do we know the forms? Well, part of it's recollection. This is what we mean by reflection. Before your body, I'm, I'm sorry, before your soul was melded into your body, it existed independently in the world of the forms. Now soul again is not a religious soul. It's psyche. It's that which makes you your, your mental makeup. It's not a religious soul, although we use the word soul. And because the soul, that which makes you what you are, is immaterial. And it exists in the world of the forms, it has direct contact. So it has immediate, immediate knowledge of the forms. Then the soul gets trapped in the body and now there's a wall between what it used to know, immediate knowledge of the forms. Because there's a wall between you now, the soul's in a body, it's trapped in a body. So, knowledge really is a matter of remembering what you knew before. Strange idea. It's remembering what you knew before. And material things, visible things, particulars, Remind them of the essences previously known. And I'll give you an example of that in a moment. Well, maybe I'll do it now. 
I want you to define the word dog. Tell me what a dog is. Come on, folks. What? Mammal. It's a mammal. Well, that doesn't tell me much. There's 5,000 mammals. How do I know a dog's a dog? It's a four-legged animal. It's a four-legged animal. So it's a mammal with four legs. Well, that probably reduces it down to uh, 2,000 mammals. Come on, define a dog. It's something you know all the, you see it all the time. Carnivore. It's a carnivore. Okay. That reduces it down some more. Uh, closely related to the wolf. Well, that doesn't help because I don't know what a wolf is. Fair enough. Yes. Domesticated. Well, yeah, dogs are domesticated. Uh, and, that, and that's a very important thing. Uh, domestication requires not only a change in physiology, it, retain, it requires a change in psychology. And dogs are definitely domesticated. What else? I don't know. How do you know a dog's a dog is what I'm asking. How do you know a dog's a service animal? Because it wears a jacket that says I'm a service animal? Barks. I mean, monkeys are service animals too. It what? Barks. Not all dogs bark. Sure. There's a barkless dog of Africa. It's called a Bazinji. It squeals like a pig, but it doesn't bark. <laughs> and seals bark. And minor birds bark. I know that because there was a minor bird in the apartment complex I lived in with my uh, shepherd, and that minor bird learned to bark like my shepherd. People would blame my dog when it was the minor bird. Uh, in the Western world today, it's best known as the domesticated animal man shows to defend. Eh, how do you see that when you see a dog? When you see a dog, how do you know it's man's best friend? Because you know it's a dog. The question is, how do you know what you're seeing is a dog? What? It, well, it's a mammal. It has hair. All mammals have hair. It's warm-blooded. The female of the species produces milk and suckles the young. But you don't know that when you see a dog. How do you know a dog is a dog? If I brought a hyena in here, what does it look like? A dog. It looks like a dog. Is it a dog? No. no. But it has all the characteristics of a dog. So how do you know a dog from a hyena? Yes. Um, in my opinion, I think if we're to distinguish a dog, I think we're looking more of the mental aspect rather than the physical aspect. The what aspects? Mental aspect. What, 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 what's unique about a dog? Um, they're different compared to other animals because they're, like, you connect with them more on a spiritual level, in yeah. my opinion. Great. When I see a dog, can I see any of that? Yes. You can? If you've never seen a dog before, no. If you've never seen a dog, uh, let me give you an example. A little Johnny suffers from an auto-immune uh, deficiency and he's lived in a bu bubble for his first five years. <clears throat> Never been out of the bubble. He has a dog, a Rottweiler. You all know what a Rottweiler looks like. You saw one early in the semester. Okay. It looks like a Doberman on steroids, except the Rottweiler is much older as a breed. The Rottweiler is 5,000 years old as a breed and Dobies are about 150, 160 years. They are bred out of Rottweilers. Okay, Johnny is cured now, and his father is ecstatic, because now he's gonna take Johnny to see all his aunts and uncles, okay? They go to Aunt Betty's, and they open the door, and a chihuahua comes charging out. And Johnny says, Daddy, what's that? And Daddy looks at Johnny. Johnny, it's a dog. He said, no, Daddy, that can't be a dog. The dog is this tall. Weighs a lot. Has dropped ears. Stubbed tail. Is black and tan. This thing is this big. It ain't got no hair. It's a Mexican hair. Which is one. Oh, Johnny, dogs come in all sizes and shapes. Oh, okay. Now that I go Uncle Ben's, they open the door and out bounds an Irish wolfhound. 
39 inches tall, right at the shoulder. Huge, square face. Silver and black curly hair. And Johnny said, Daddy, what's that? Dad looked, Johnny, I told you, dogs come in all shapes and sizes. It's a dog. Really? Now they go to Uncle William's. And Uncle William's lives on a big ranch. And they're driving up this long driveway. And little Johnny sees this big, large, brown thing surrounded by a fence. And says, Daddy, Daddy, look at the giant dog. And Daddy says, well, you stupid kid, it's a horse. <laughs> What's really funny about the story is little children never make that mistake. Little children never compare dogs, never make the mistake of thinking a horse is a dog. And the question is why? They both have tails. They both have four legs. They have two eyes. They have teeth. They have feet. They have fur. They're mammals, which you don't know by looking at an animal that it's a mammal. And the question is why does Johnny never make that mistake? It's because you can't define a dog by its characteristics, because it fits other animals. When you think you know the general category of something, because you have experience with individual things within that category, it's called abstraction. You get the universal concept of dogginess by meeting many dogs. That's Aristotle's position. It's not Plato's position. Plato says, the concept comes first. Dogginess is what you know. And when you see something, you know whether or not it fits the category that you already have an understanding of because you understand the form of dogginess. By the way, the only way you can define a <coughs> dog is through its DNA. A dog is a dog because it has doggy DNA. It's the only way you can define a dog. The trouble is you cannot see the DNA of an animal. So you think things like whales at one time were fish and not mammals. You thought at one time panda bears were bears and then you thought they were raccoons and now you think they're bears again. People think that hyenas are dogs when they look at them but they're really what? You don't watch nature programs, huh? Are they like coyote? No, no, coyotes are canid. They're, 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 they're closely related. No, they're more closely related to cats. Really? That's why lions and hyenas hate each other so much. They're both cats going after the same prey. Okay. If I have an idea, a universal idea of dogginess, I can then recognize the dog when I see it. And we'll go into another one. You wearing a blue shirt? You have blue in your shirt? That's it, no more blue? Anyone wearing jeans that are blue? There we go. We have three different blues. The thing that possesses the quality of being blue is a particular. The characteristic of blueness is universal. So the quality is universal. The thing that possesses the quality is a particular. In the material world, we encounter particulars. We don't abstract from the particulars what blue is because that blue is different from that blue and that blue. But they all share or participate in the universal form of blueness. <coughs> By the way, when you leave the cave and you go up the rugged descent, ascent out of the cave, that stands for ed education. And education is actually a process of remembering. Cannot teach you anything that you have not previously known. I can help you remember it, according to Plato. So how do we know the forms? Well, Besides recollection and how you help to someone to remember things through the Socratic dialogue, the power of abstracting the essence of things and discovering the relations of all divisions of knowledge to each other, and the dialectic 
the Socratic dialectic method begins with recognizing you don't know anything. You have to recognize your own ignorance. That's the start. I don't know. But here's a possibility of an answer. And let's now examine the answer. So you have to formulate or find a way of suppressing some belief that you believe to be true. Then it's put to the test of the dialectic. It's the process of inquiry. I ask questions about your belief. Just like we did it in here. What's a dog? It's a mammal. Well, that's way too broad a definition. You've got to make it, oh, it's a four-legged mammal. But there are many four-legged mammals. That's the Socratic method. And to, in the case of defining a dog, we'll wind up at a dead end until we recognize the only way to define a dog is through its DNA. And that's something that you never have knowledge of when you see a dog on the street. So that's putting the opinion to the test of analysis, logical analysis. Now, if the opinion that you express at the beginning of the dialectic fails to withstand this analysis, or if somehow or other it leads to a contradiction, or if it's in conflict with some given previously accepted belief, it's rejected. And so the process then has to start all over again. We saw that when I talked about Thrasymachus and his discussion with Socrates about what justice is. It's doing what's in the interest of the stronger, and Plato showed, I mean Socrates showed, that that can't be the definition because of what a physician is, what a groom is, what a captain of a ship is, and what a ruler truly is. And so the opinion is rejected and we start all over. And you have a new search. If in the new search, the new opinion withstands the dialectic, responses are consistent, and are compatible with previously accepted opinions, guess what? Good to go. It could be true. Doesn't mean it is. It only means it could be true. Could be true. You always have to keep that in mind. So, knowledge has some necessary conditions. They are justification, which you know from Clifford, truth, and belief. Now comes Eros as the third part of what's necessary to reach knowledge of the forms. What did they offer you, Uvura? Oh, nothing really important, just... Eros is the power of desire. And it is Eros that leads people step by step as described in a dialogue called the Symposium, which I very strongly suggest you read. It's the simplest of all the dialogues to understand, and it's funny. It's all about love. The symposium is a discussion about one topic. In Greek, you'd have a, a big dinner with many people, and they'd all give opinions about one topic. And the symposium, the topic is love. This is known as the ladder of love from the symposium. And this is how it works. You go from being enamored with a physical object, a beautiful thing, a beautiful object. And from the love of a beautiful object, you go step by step to have the love of a beautiful thought. And from beautiful thought, then you begin to want to understand and be able to love the very essence of beauty itself. So you go from, actually goes from the love of a beautiful thing to the love of beautiful things to the love of beautiful ideas to 
a love of beauty itself. Beauty as a universal property is different than something that's beautiful. What makes something beautiful? That's the essence of beauty. And that's what you want to understand. The nature of beauty. That's the ladder of love. Well, that's what happens. You go from Icasia to Dianoia. No, from Icasia to Pistis to Dianoia to Noesis. The ladder of love. So from the love of something beautiful to the love of beauty itself. Love is the desire for the permanent possession of the good. In order to have permanent possession of good, the good, which is the highest of all the forms, you really would have to have some sense of immortality. Because it's going to take a long time to reach that level of knowledge. You deed to me your so or so. And in exchange I give you immortality. True immortality. The true satisfaction or desire for the permanence of good can only be found in philosophy. Now, this chart has nothing to do with Plato. It has to do with the contemporary world. To tell you the power of philosophy in our society now. This is a chart of the mean graduate record exam scores. In order to get to graduate school, you got to take GRE exams, and people who major in philosophy score the highest in the verbal skills. They are lower in mathematical skills, and they are in the top when it comes to writing skills. Interesting. So if you want to really do well, on your verbal and writing skills, the English part of your GREs, it's good to be a philosophy major. And you're not so bad in the math part either. And it makes sense that in quantitative, the math skills, math majors, I don't know how they get in there. Engineering, computer, chemistry, biology all make perfect sense to be high in the quantitative. I don't know how economics gets there, but I guess because they have to do statistical analysis. Law school admission tests. Look who scores the highest. Philosophy majors. Graduate management admission tests. Number three. Annual philosophy, uh, annual <laughs> uh, income uh, for philosophy majors. Uh, annual salary, they start out the fourth, but their salary growth is the highest. So, it may be a good idea to think about going into philosophy. I don't know. I personally don't recommend it, but they do. Just thought as an aside that is fun. Here's how the ladder of love is described in the symposium. I'm going to do very quickly, okay? Nor will his vision of the beautiful take the form of anything that is of the flesh. It will be neither words nor knowledge of anything that is, but subsisting of itself. In the eternal oneness, it will be neither more nor less, but still the same inviolable whole. Starting from individual beauties, the quest for the universal beauty must find him ever mounting the heavenly ladder. Stepping from rung to rung, that is, from one to two, and from two to every lovely body, from bodily beauty to the beauty of institutions, from institutions to learning, and from learning in general to the specific lore that pertains to nothing but the beautiful itself, until at last he comes to know what beauty is. And this is true about all the forms. What is justice? You can give me all kinds of definitions of justice, and I guarantee you I will find something wrong with them through the Socratic method. And you will see that your knowledge of what justice is really amounts to some kind of gut feeling that you're able to pick out just and unjust instances. 
but never really tell me what justice is. For example, and this is a true story, a young lady is raped, a suspect is captured and thrown in jail, the young lady is the daughter of a cop, the precinct sergeant where the man is incarcerated calls the girl's father, he comes down to the precinct, goes to the holding cell where the suspect is, pulls out his service revolver and shoots him six times. Now how he doesn't kill him, I don't know. But the perp isn't killed. It's later discovered he didn't do it. They put the cop on trial for attempted murder. You're the jury. Guilty or innocent? Guilty. Innocent. Why, why, why is he not guilty? I heard someone say innocent. Why is he not guilty? Uh, from my perspective, he's not guilty because I have a daughter too. And uh, I can relate to that. A lot of people can. So you, you, no matter, you, you would uh, indulge in what's called jury nullification? Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's fine. And as a matter of fact, the jury did. They acquitted him. And in their infinite wisdom, the LA Police Department promoted him. True story. Is that just, though? To some. Is that just or unjust that he was, or unjust, that he was exonerated? I mean, obviously tried to kill the guy. I, I don't care that it's, I have a daughter too, you know. Turns out the guy's innocent to boot. So that's a tough question. And there are many things like that. Whether or not justice has been truly served. And the only way you know that is you have to understand what justice is. What is justice? Somebody, give me a definition of justice. What's in the greatest interest of the leaders? What's in the greatest interest of the... Leaders. The leaders. Well, that's what Thrasymachus gave, and I can go through Socrates' rebuttal of that. You were here when we did that, right? So you know that doesn't work. Yes? It's the attempt to fuse immaterial constructs to material occurrences. Like, well, that's what it attempts to do, but you're still not telling me what it is. Well, I'm saying that's why it's difficult to exactly explain what it is. Yeah, you can't give a defini definition of it, not in our terms, because most of us don't truly believe justice exists in the world. We think it's a societal construct. Because it's, it's kind of hard to say what's right and what's wrong, because what's right for you, probably not right for me. Well, and that makes, but that's the whole thing that Plato's fighting against. This relativistic view of right and wrong and good and beauty and justice. The truth of the matter is, unless justice truly exists in the world, there is no justice. Everything is relative, which means, again, what they do in society A is okay, but if they do the same thing in society B, it's bad. And we don't want to live in a world like that. I guarantee it. Certain things have to be wrong, intrinsically wrong. Slavery. Genocide. The Holocaust. Racism. Those things have to be intrinsically wrong. Because if I can justify it in one instance by saying, well, they thought it was okay, then I can justify anything. Again, oh, we didn't do it in here. Let me make sure. Okay. Is that yours? Color your hair? No. It's yours. Okay. Uh, we're a society, and we've decided people with blonde hair and blue eyes are inferior. The they simply jokes. are. The blonde jokes? Blonde. No, I'm not going to go into blonde jokes, but we, as a society, decide it's okay to treat those people as second-class citizens. Now, the next society over is made up of people with blonde hair and blue eyes, and they think people with dark hair and dark eyes and dark skin are inferior. Is that okay? Well, not if I have dark hair and dark eyes and dark skin, I don't want to be in that society, and she doesn't want to be in this one. It can't be right in one to discriminate and wrong in the other to discriminate. 
Some things have to be intrinsically wrong. Murder is intrinsically wrong. Not killing, but murder is intrinsically wrong. Yes. I think justice is to have whatever I Put your want. hand down away from me. Justice is to have the, any ideology you want. And even if you think it should be acted upon, never to be acted upon if it infringes on another person's ideology. No, no, that's not what justice is. That's what prejudice is. It's okay to be prejudiced as long as you don't impose it. There's a difference between being prejudiced and discrimination. You can hate certain people, but you can't discriminate against them. Prejudice is psychological, discrimination is an action. And that's what you're saying. No, you can believe whatever you want. That's not what we're discussing here. We're discussing what justice really is, or if it's assuming it exists. And if it doesn't exist, then you can justify any atrocious act. And that's what bothers Plato. That's why he introduces the forms. Now, along with Plato's theory of the forms uh, comes his cosmological, or how the world comes to be. And they include Pythagoras' view of the world. You see why? You see the relationship between Plato and Pythagoras? Anybody besides him, anybody. What's the ultimate reality of the world for Pythagoras? Numbers. Numbers. They are immaterial, but real. And so are ideas for Plato. Zero. One. Two. Three. Four. So Plato's view of the world includes that the Pythagorean view of the world is number and in the Heraclitus view of the world is flux and logos. Because the physical world is doing what? But the ultimate reality of the world is static. Static ideas. One reason people resist change is because they focus on what they have to give up instead of what they have to gain. Good motto to live by. One reason people resist change is because they focus on what they have to give up instead of what they have to gain. Just the thought for the day. And it also includes Parmenides' vision of eternal, unchanging, unknowable reality. The forms, which for Plato in certain circumstances are in fact knowable. There's a benefit to this two-world view. There's a real benefit to it. It allows for a world of change and impermanence. The world the way our senses perceive it. It allows for the material world. And an ideal world populated by the unchanging eternal forms which explain the changing material world. So you have the ultimate reality in the world of the forms. That doesn't mean material things don't exist. But the causative agent of the material world are the forms. Because things share in the forms. Maybe you can understand it as copy the forms or participate in the forms in some way. The more closely something participates in or copies the form, the more perfect it is. For example, a dog show. How many people have been to a dog show? Nobody. Well, this is how a dog show works. You have a dog breeds, and they pick the best example of the breed. So when I showed my rot, there was what's called the standard what the ideal Rottweiler should look like. And when you judge looks at the rods, the one that comes closest to the standard is the best of that breed for that day. Now, judges look at the standard a little bit differently, but that's what the forms are. They're the standards. This is what perfect justice looks like. The more closely something in the real world approaches more justice, 
the more perfect it is. It's not perfect. Does everyone understand that? You're moving towards perfection when you have a greater share in the form. So, a beautiful object shares to a greater degree in the form of beauty than an ugly one does. So the world that we live in, the physical world, is in flux, as Heraclitus argued. But the world of being, existence, true existence, is eternal and unchanging. So here we have Plato synthesizing Heraclitus, and he applies it only to the physical world. And Parmenides, to the world of ideas, along with Pythagoras. It's a wonderful way to solve the problems that Parmenides <clears throat> gave us. The illusion of motion and, and change. They are real in the world, in the physical world. And that's what's really good about this dualism of Plato. So Plato's vision interrelated the two worlds and allows us to have a glimpse of this ideal world through anybody? Reason. It's through reason that we understand the world. The real world. The world of the forms. So now the ideal world of the forms becomes knowable through reason, which is opposed to unknowable for Parmenides. In the world of the forms, and I will reiterate this. This desk, or whatever the heck it is, is recognized as a desk because we previously understand the form of deskness. We don't understand this as a desk because we've seen many desks. And I'll give you a perfect example. I went to someone's house a very long time ago and sitting in the middle of the living room, there was this round thing. And I had no bloody idea what it was. What do you think this round, leather-covered thing was? Many years ago. Ottoman. What? Ottoman. Well, that's close. An ottoman I would have recognized, but this thing was big. beanbag chair. I had never seen one. And even though I have a concept of what makes a chair a chair, that thing didn't fit it. And if the only chairs I'd ever seen were beanbag chairs, would I ever know that that's a chair? No. No. So you cannot get the notion of chairness by encountering chairs. Because a stool is a chair. No back and three legs. It's a subset, right? There are too many different kinds of chairs. There are too many different kinds of physical objects to abstract it, just like you cannot abstract by looking at dogs that something is a dog. You have to have the concept first. And that's why little Johnny never confuses a horse with a dog. Because he already comes with the concept of dogginess and horseness. Yes, sir? Okay, but say little Johnny's dad's not there and his older brother wants to trick him. He says, yeah, that's a dog. Then so what? Johnny's going to... But that never happens. That's the point. It could. No, it can't. You, know, it's gold one it's you will gold never gold. find a kid who confuses a dog with a horse. He may not know what a dog is, and he may not know what a horse is, but he knows they're not the same. Yeah. Immediately. Even though if you define a horse, and you define a dog, the characteristics that you see, that you see, are pretty close. If you define a hyena, and you define a dog, by what they look like, they're pretty close. And we make mistakes sometimes. 
For a long time, hyenas were thought to be in the dog family. Whales were thought to be fish. Okay? It happens on very, but very rare occasion. It's called mistaken concreteness. It very rarely happens. And little kids never make the mistake. When they see Lassie with the long hair and the pointed nose, the collie, and they see a chihuahua, they know immediately they're both dogs. They don't know what kind of dog they are. All Lassies look like Lassies to them, so every collie is called a Lassie when they're very young. But they know it's a dog. And when they see strange looking dogs, and there are some very strange looking dogs, they recognize them as dogs, they just don't know what kind it is. The same thing with pussycats. No kid ever confuses a pussycat with a dog, but their characteristics are very similar. Very, very similar. Especially since there's a cat, one cat, that doesn't have retractable claws. And that's a cheetah that can't retract its claws. So you can't use that as the defining characteristic. I'll give you a better one. Define a human being. by its observable characteristics. Hmm. Two-legged mammal. It's a two-legged mammal, that's true. Uh, able to manipulate fire. It, it manipulates fire, but you don't see me manipulating <laughs> fire, so that doesn't work. I don't know, man. What? Well, it makes us a primate. There's lots of primates in the world. Yeah, but yeah. What? Well, it narrows it down. Uh, as soon as he said a bipedal mammal, because there really aren't any other bipedal mammals. But there are other mammals that walk on two legs on occasion. <clears throat> what happens if I don't have my legs? What if I'm born without legs? Am I still human? Yes. So legginess and being bipedal can't really be the defining characteristic of being human. Yes, I would. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Oh, who was it? Someone started to say something. That, that contradicts your thing where it's like outliers, where it's like some kid doesn't differentiate with the dog and the horse, and you're just saying, well, what if someone doesn't have legs? Well, that's well, but a kid will still recognize it as a human being. Right, but some... Because it's not the defining... Having legs and arms is not the defining characteristics of human beings. Think about it. I mean, am I still a human being with one arm? Am I still a human being with no arms? But you're asking someone from the same species to describe it's like they're gonna have a uh, I can only talk about human species. I don't know what goes through the minds of other animals. We're speaking abstractly. No, no, no. You, I don't. I can only talk about human beings. We want to talk about us. Right. Philosophers don't talk about what goes on in the head of other animals. Okay. Th th those are biologists or or people who study uh, animal behavior. Uh, <clears throat> not not us. Yes. Uh, downward facing nostrils. For a downward facial, facing nostrils. Oh, most dogs have downward facing nostrils. Well, if we're limiting it to bipedal primates. It's only only humans. No, have in bonobos and chimps have downward facing nostrils. We speak. Well, other animals have a language, just not the same yeah. as ours, but they have language. But worthy, I, I know that worthy only. Um... Oh, so if I'm mute, I'm not human. No, but if I can't, you just said speaking is an essential characteristic of the human being. And first, I told you other animals communicate, mm -hmm. so they're speaking. They communicate. In the... Yeah, well, that's all speaking is. It's a form of communication. What if I'm mute? What if I can't speak? Does that mean I'm not human? So I got no arms and no legs. And I'm, I'm, I'm mute. Does that mean I'm not human? Yes. Well, then you can contradict whatever aspect of a human in any way you want to make you. any accusation or any reference of what a human is being correct. <laughs> because you can't define a human being through abstraction. Oh, they have noses. We'll just cough. His nose. That's the point. You cannot define a human being by its physical characteristics. There's only one way to define any human being. It's DNA. And we don't experience that. We see phenotype, not genotype. I can see what you look like, but I can't see what your blueprint is. I mean, what happens, people like to say, well, the ability to think and do mental arithmetic. Well, what happens if I'm in a canatonic state or I've had a lobotomy? 
I'm still human. You're still human when you're dead. You're just a dead human being. So it's very hard. And yet, we have no trouble recognizing human beings when we see them. We don't mistake chimps for human beings. And Plato contends, and I'm supporting his view at the moment, because when I present philosophers, I always take their point of view. He's correct. We have a concept of humanness, dogginess, blueness, chairness. And when we come into physical things, they remind us of these things that we knew before the soul was trapped in the body through recollection. And I'll give you another example. So is that, is that kind of like reincarnation? In a sense? Well, it's a little bit like reincarnation. Because no, you're remembering what you used to know. Yeah, it's just the souls get recycled, and in that sense, it's reincarnation. But for different reasons and for different purposes. Listen, Plato demonstrates this in the Republic through Socrates, but it doesn't matter. A farm boy never had any school. Socrates asked him, if you have a plot of land, a plot of land, that's one square, okay, in each direction, what's the area? What's the area of something that's one unit in each direction? What's the area of a rectangle? One square unit. Length times width. So if it's a square, and it's one by one by one by one, its area is one. Then he asks, so what if I double the dimensions? What happens to the area? Can't ask you, but somebody. Quadruples. Yeah, but that's not what the kid answers. He's never been in school. It doubles. That makes perfect sense. If I double the dimensions, I double the area. And through a process of questions and answers, okay, never telling the kid that the area of a triangle is we equal one side times the other, I mean the area of a rectangle is length times width. So if I go from one by one to two by two, I go from one square unit to four square units, the quadruples. He never tells the kid just multiply length times width. The kid comes to it on his own, which means he's remembering something that he previously knew. And that's what learning is for, for Plato. Okay, we will continue this on uh, Tuesday. Remember, the test is due 6 o'clock Tuesday. Uh, someone remember where I left off. You want to turn the uh, camera off?